Welcome to the Parts Town Parts Cast, your go to podcast to hear thought leaders and experts in the food service industry discuss all the latest trends, technology, and products that are shaping our space. I'm your new host, Matt Gentile, and I look forward to this opportunity to share all these amazing insights happening in our industry. In today's episode, we're going to discuss a topic that's been the focus of many restaurants and commercial businesses. In fact, it's even been brought up on this podcast before. We're going to talk about a rising IoT solution. IoT, of course, stands for Internet of Things. This technology lets devices analyze and communicate data to other devices without human intervention. So basically, it lets devices talk to each other. Now, this smart solution is still relatively new in the food service space, but it's growing and could become the new norm before you know it. Powerhouse Dynamics is a developer of cloud-based IoT solutions, including its Open Kitchen and SiteSage concepts that are used in a variety of spaces, including quick service restaurants, and retailers. They recently implemented solutions into Arby's and other Inspire Brands locations and saw some positive results. Joining us to discuss this and more is Jay Fisk, Vice President of Business Development at Powerhouse Dynamics. Welcome to the Partscast, Jay. Matt, thanks so much for having me. We're very excited to be here and uh, share a bit of our story. Before we get into just the solutions that, that Powerhouse Dynamics offers and talk a little bit about IoT, could you tell us what, when did Powerhouse get into the commercial space? How did it all start? Yeah, sure. So it was actually about a decade ago. Um, it's an interesting backstory to the, the genesis of Powerhouse Dynamics. Interestingly enough, it started out as a residential energy management system. Our, our first product was called the eMonitor. It was a series of energy sensors that were installed inside people's homes to kind of track their energy consumption and where it was going. And, you know, you could yell at your kids when they left their bedroom lights on and see you didn't need to run your pool pump so much. And it was kind of an interesting place to start. But what we realized was there just weren't really enough, uh, I'll just say, uh, energy nerds like me out there to make a super compelling market. But what we recognized is uh, that we had created a platform to address a pretty unserved market, and that is the large multi-site operators of small commercial facilities, in particular those who feel the pain of energy most acutely, meaning a lot in food service, uh, small box commercial retail, and convenience stores. And so we really pivoted the company around 2011 into the commercial space, starting kind of on this foundation of energy diagnostics and energy management and sort of built the platform from there as we got into more and more companies. And, you know, listening, there's there's always, you know, it's funny since I've been with the company, essentially since its start, there's the business you plan and then there's the business that happens. And, you know, customers are, are funny that way. They ask you to do really interesting things that you hadn't thought of necessarily from the very beginning. And that's really been sort of our trajectory as a company too. It's a combination of, we had this vision for providing an enterprise-wide system for the large, you know, multi-site 50, 100, 500, 1,000 plus location organizations to help them control and manage energy. And kind of realized there was a, a, a bigger opportunity even than that, right? In helping manage more than just lighting or HVAC equipment. Yeah, so it's been a really fun evolution over the years. You know, we've been in, uh, we've been an internet of things company since really before that term was even coined and got so frothy as it has, as it is now. And it, it certainly is a growing trend. I do want to get to that in a little bit, but you guys have two big platforms that you use. You have Open Kitchen and site sage right. what's the difference between the two for for our listeners i mean they're, they're they both they both share the same platform site sage is what we use in our retail uh, medical clinics gyms other non-food service entities um and it centers around hvac control and diagnostics automating on off schedules of lighting and signage um, we do have some integration with systems like irrigation and some deeper integrations with digital HVAC units. But that's so, so SiteSage is sort of in those markets. Open Kitchen entails all of that, um, but this is what we call our platform for food service companies. So uh, convenience store chains, restaurant chains, and food retail, 
where we, we have the enterprise-wide control over heating and air conditioning and lighting and signage, in addition to a broader suite of capabilities to connect to critical back of house equipment, namely uh, cooking equipment, refrigeration equipment, you know, dish machines, automating and digitizing food safety processes. So it's kind of site sage on steroids, basically, mm. and focused on um, food service customers. So more all encompassing then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, you know, a restaurant from an infrastructure perspective is a much more complex thing than a, a retail. I mean, a retail is a it's a it's a box with HVAC and lighting, and, and I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but that's you know that's the basics. But you know, restaurants you have that plus you've got fryers and ovens and dish machines and ice machines, et cetera, et cetera, and a, a, a lot more potential points of failure, a lot more potential points of risk, and a lot more complexity in terms of managing your capex, your operating costs, um, et cetera. And so you, you mentioned IoT, of course, and I think like many many industries, you know, COVID accelerated certain trends, and and we've seen in in the right. food service space, delivery takeout was on the rise and it really, you know, exploded in 2020 due to the the shutdowns from COVID. And it looks like it's, it's here to stay. And I think we're seeing IOT sort of pick up as well and accelerate with that trend. Are, are you starting to see the growing demand with over at Powerhouse Dynamics? Are you getting more inquiries about about your solutions because of these accelerations and trends? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, look, I mean, our markets, you know, retailers and, and restaurants have been uh, on the front lines of, of COVID and quarantine. And it was obviously a pretty tough time and continues to be a tough time. At the same time, you know, this is a real inflection point in the industry, right? This disruption also is bringing about, as you pointed out, incredible opportunities for innovation. And certainly, you know, look, there are, there are just as many people who need to eat just as much food, right? But how they do that has changed for, for, for some obvious reasons in this, in this past year. You know, these, especially in the food service side, you're, you're seeing thinner staff levels, you know, staff being asked to do more with less. Um, you're needing um, greater agility because schedules may need to change, you know, dining rooms closed, dining rooms open, the hours change. A heightened awareness at the leadership level for making sure that they are delivering a, a safe experience for the customers, not only in ter terms of the safety of the food, but now the safety of the environment too. So all of that really drives a lot of interest in getting data uh, across the enterprise and delivering that visibility, but also delivering, I would say, a more robust and agile entity, right, that can accommodate changing markets, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to say, like, you know, no one has said to us, well, we're, we want to do this connected thing because of COVID. But so is it correlation or is it causality? Um, there has been a very, very strong correlation, though, that we've seen in the uptick and in interest in connecting to critical equipment, and that so I think it is. I think it is in part driven by the disruption we're seeing from COVID, but it's also it's also just the confluence of a bunch of things finally being ready. Right, most critical equipment mm -hmm. now, the most expensive things, whether you look at ovens or fryers or shake machines, what have you, you know, these fairly capex intensive things. These are sophisticated machines, right? And now I can say in a fairly consistent way, uh, all the OEMs have connectivity strategies and are delivering products that are beginning to have that kind of capability, right? So that's one trend, which is, is, really, is really emerging in a very strong way. The second is you know, we, ubiquitous internet connectivity. And the third is, you know, we're sort of, I think businesses are finally seeing, and these companies are finally seeing, we, we are moving to a subscription economy, right? And that goes for how they, how they get enterprise software too, right? So internet connectivity, cloud-based, uh, subscription-based enterprise software, and the availability of connectivity in these machines all kind of converging at the same time. This disruption in our economy from COVID is, is driving an increased desire for visibility and reduction of risk. So yeah, it, it all is kind of uh, coming together in a very interesting way. And of course, then on top of that, you've got these 
um, incredibly well funded startups that are out to really disrupt things with ghost kitchens and mobile food, right? And they're, they're, they're all basically tech firms that happen to make food, right? And they're, they're very data driven. And that includes, um, you know, the equipment in their infrastructure, how they're producing their products and how they're responding to market demands. I do actually want to get into that because that's another thing that's accelerated because of COVID is ghost kitchens and these off off-site kitchens because these hospitality groups chains are looking at this opportunity to take that operation and consolidate it into one kitchen where they could prep and cook everything and get the orders out the door from one space. Um, how do you think IOT can help with that and make it a more efficient process for these places? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is really another, I'd say, accelerant to the adoption of IoT. I mean, we have, we've got, a, you know, we've got, you know, a typical QSR would, you know, want to do things like a recipe update to an oven or a fryer if they've got some limited time offer. That happens maybe four times a year, roughly speaking, right? There are new um, concepts now that are doing recipe updates multiple times per day. Right. If you think about um, the, the, their business model is I want to be able to, to change up what we offer for products. I want to be able to change up the concepts based on data, what the market is telling us. They need that agility. Right. So whether you're mobile, mobile and you're doing that or if you've got, you know, fixed assets, but, you know, ghost kitchen, there's various iterations on the ghost kitchen model. But a lot of them are saying, look, we're going to give you this infrastructure you deliver your concept, you make your products and, you know, you, you get it delivered. But, you know, one day, you know, this oven needs to support product X, the next day it needs to support product Y. So, yeah, it's really, you know, the ghost kitchen model, I would argue, requires uh, connectivity in many ways to be successful and to, to, to have that kind of um, agility and to have the kind of, I'll say, asset utilization that they need to, to make money and have a successful uh, business. So in our opening, we mentioned that that Powerhouse Dynamics implemented IoT solutions for Arby's and Inspire brands. And I read that by optimizing the kitchen operations and facility performance, uh, they saved $40 million in energy expenses and roughly $43 million in labor costs. I mean, that's pretty impressive. What specifically do these solutions do? And you've brought up some examples. To get elaborate a little more, uh, how does it make the day-to-day -day operations easier? And, and more efficient in these restaurants. Yeah, yeah. And they've been, Inspire has been just a, a, you know, a terrific uh, customer and, and partner of ours for, for many years now. And we've been fortunate because they're, they're, they're very strategic about how they look at their operations. They're very quantitative to say, here are the leverage points in our business where a little bit more automation, a little bit more uh, data has incredible leverage in terms of how you manage labor, how you manage other operating costs like energy. Um, and it's a really, it's, they're a great case study for how other companies can think about deploying these kinds of technologies. Um, so Peter Cryan, who is the Senior Director of Equipment Innovation, really gave a tremendous um, presentation um, about a year ago at a conference where he talked about their strategy. And, and really, for them, it was about creating this roadmap where their initial foray into IoT and connectivity was centered around energy and energy management. So let's put in the communicating thermostats. Let's put in the energy sensors and the temperature sensors for the enterprise-wide control over heating and cooling and enterprise-wide diagnostics over, over the, that, those critical systems and watch and measure the impact looking, it's just math, looking at the utility bills before open kitchen and we can look at after Open Kitchen. At the time, it was branded as SightSage. We have a bit of a rebranding, but, uh, and, and seeing that impact and sort of being able to come back to the leadership team at Inspire and say, look, this thing is delivering us, uh, I think it was a 12-month payback based solely on energy savings, mm -hmm. right? And now they've got the infrastructure with the gateway we have in there that communicates wirelessly to the various components that are deployed. Um, they've, now they've got this infrastructure that's paid for itself in a very quick pace that can support their next phase of digitization, right? So let's pull data from our ovens that cook our roast beef and automate um, the, the data collection process for food safety, right? Previously, you know, you had to, when you're cooking a particular protein, 
right? You temper it in the walk-in cooler until it was ready to, to cook at the appropriate temperature. Then you you temp it, right? Uh, write that down, initial it, put it in the oven, click go, right? Cook it. When it's done, pull it out, temp it, write it down, you know, put it on the slicer, make some sandwiches, you know, temp it, put it back in. So it was a very labor intensive process um, that just took the operators away from doing what they do best, which is, you know, making delicious products and, and ensuring their customers are having a great experience. And so no one likes doing that paperwork. And so, you know, one, one example of this next phase of IoT for them is automating some of these critical food safety data collection processes, right? So that, that process now uh, is 100% automated. So the operator just receives an email in her inbox every morning saying, this is what you cooked yesterday, and here's all the information uh, related to those products that, uh, that you cooked, and you can, it's archived, it's in the cloud, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can print it out if you want to, but you can go back and get uh, you know, whatever you want, uh, whenever you want it. Um, and so there's tremendous labor savings there. There's tremendous uh, benefits into increasing product yield because you're making sure that these ovens, ovens are, are operating exactly as they're supposed to. I mean, even a 1% increase in yield has a tremendous impact on profitability. Um, and so it's just sort of built from there, from, from, from ovens to fryers. If you think about fryers, right? It's a three vat fryer. These are, these are pretty capital intensive investments they're making. Uh, and they're critical to product quality. If, you're, if your fryers are at the wrong temperature, or the oil quality is bad, you're gonna serve a bad product, right? It's also very expensive and very resource intensive operation, all the cooking oil, you know, you're spending hundreds, if not over a thousand dollars a month on oil to operate a fryer. And so let's use the data from that fryer to make sure you're optimizing that resource, right? You're getting the most value out of that oil and you're delivering the highest quality products you can and making sure the staff isn't overly excessively skipping oil filtrations, right? That the oil quality that the system is automatically measuring is where it needs to be, right? that you're benchmarking and you're seeing these outliers on oil consumption. I do find it interesting though, like a lot of what these solutions catch are really the small things that just fall through the cracks every time. And it's, it's those things that over time add up and you know, you, you could end up spending, spending more money because you're not focused on how often you're filtering your oil or, you know, your temperature settings are off and it, it destroys quality of taste. So it, it is interesting that these solutions really are there to kind of pick up all these, these things that do fall through the cracks. Right. Yeah, exactly. Tell me when my shake machine is low on mix, right? I don't want to run out. If someone wants to order a shake, it should be ready. So send me a text message if it's out of mix, right? So yeah, you, and you're right. And so, you know, one of the interesting things about, about IoT and data that we've learned sometimes the hard way uh, over the years, but also just through a lot of experiences that, you know, there, there is so much data that's out there, right? And that's cool, but the real impact is what do you do with that information, right? Because you know, a, a modern fryer with a digital control has dozens of different dip points it's collecting every single minute. Your, your store manager does not need to know dozens of things about the fryer every single minute, but she does need to know, right, when there's a real problem. And so a lot of this is like taking this reams and reams of data and distilling it down and saying, you know, it's not that Anytime there's a problem, anytime an employee, for example, skips an auto filtration cycle in the fryer, it's not going to send off alarm bells saying drop everything and because it's just too distracting, right? You're dealing with humans. There's always going to be variations from the ideal process, right? But it's taking all that data in aggregate, looking across the enterprise and saying, you hear the real consistent problem areas, right? You can fix this. Maybe the system needs um, some maintenance. Maybe the staff needs some training, right? So it's it's finally looking for those bigger trends and those higher priority issues that come through, as your to your in your words, Matt, through the through the accumulation of all these little things that stack up, and ultimately you know add risk or erode um, profitability or um, degrade product quality. That's really the beauty is looking across the enterprise, finding the exceptions and these trends and then and then acting on them. I was gonna say preventive maintenance maintenance is so big in this space because you know it's sometimes hard to point out when something's going wrong. And I think that's the the cool thing about some of these solutions too is if you start seeing a trend, right? 
why is my oil temperature not consistently getting up to speed right. might cause you to then take a deeper look into that piece of equipment and see, oh, hey, there's, there's parts that are eroding or there's something else wrong with the equipment. I need to get it re repaired or replaced. Yeah, exactly. And, it, you know, you, you, so by the time an operator says, you know what, I need to, I need to get a technician here. There's definitely something wrong. I got this alert, you know, three times today. The technician, right, can also log in. Right. And this is where, you know, maybe those dozens of data points now do come in handy because you've got that technical subject matter expert that can log in and look at all the information and say, ah, OK, here's the issue. You know, heating element is out or whatever it is. Right. I now know exactly what I need on my truck before I roll to the site. I know what, you know, VAT is, is in question if it's a fryer. And so I'm going to be able to resolve this issue with a single truck roll. Right. And then through data, I can confirm before I leave that my repair was effective, right? So you think about in terms of the ability of um, the service technicians to respond more quickly. Um, in some cases, maybe even before the operator realizes there's a problem, right? And then when they're there to be very, very effective with that single truck. Well, I mean, here's opportunities, I think, for the service community to really delight their customers, right? When they get pulled into this ecosystem and have access to the data. And in our experience, you know, most customers, since they benefit from it, are, are willing to share access to uh, these tools with their service techs, because again, they, every, everyone benefits from it. And there's opportunities as well for proactive maintenance as well. I mean, there's a lot in, in some systems, there's some intelligence to say, look, I know the, the meantime before failure of component X is 8,000 hours. And my onboard computer has just measured, it's, a, it's now 7,923 hours. Uh, you can get a message saying, hey, would you like to proactively replace this component the next time there's a service tech on site before it fails? And so you can, you can address that issue proactively uh, and before it becomes a very disruptive, right? When that system, when that fryer or the oven or whatever is down, that's a real problem, right? You've just constrained your capacity, longer time to service, perhaps maybe even some products not available. No one wants that, right? So can we get out ahead of these kinds of failures from a maintenance perspective through better information? And you definitely see the benefit from the, the QSR space and some of these larger commercial kitchens. Uh, I guess for some of the operators or owners in, in small pubs or the, the smaller casual fine dining restaurants who might be a little hesitant to implement some of these IOT solutions, uh, what would you say to them of what could be a benefit to their, their smaller footprint? I think everyone's going to, everyone can benefit from these kinds of, of, of technologies. What I would say is, you know, some of this um, can feel intimidating to people, especially that are maybe not um, as comfortable with technology, right? Start focused. Start small. Maybe it's something as simple as let's just retrofit your fridge. We've got these little battery power temperature sensors. Right? Put them in your walk-ins, put them in your reach-ins, right? And just you know keep it super simple like that and just stay on top of refrigeration temperatures. Automate the collection so your staff doesn't have to go collect that. And so you simplify what they have to collect maybe uh, several times a day for, for HACCP and food safety purposes. So you can start um, with a relatively focused solution. And then when you sort of master that area and you're comfortable with it, and you begin folding in this remote access to data into your day-to-day -day operations, then progress maybe to the next thing. Maybe you put your thermostats in place, right? People will say, well, I've got programmable thermostats. And that's cool, right? That's really good. It's better than just having some simple, you know, on-off uh, thermostat. But, you know, what we see is shortly after someone has programmed a thermostat, it, the program falls off, right? It drifts, meaning staff member is uncomfortable, so they, you know, it's too hot, so they crank it down five degrees and they press hold and go on about their day. And of course, it's a really tough job. People are super busy and they forget. So you see that all the time where a thermostat is, you know, set to 68 degrees and is in pre someone pressed hold and it's been that way for months. Um, so having you know, remote access and providing the ability with software to say, look, if you're uncomfortable, you can set it up uh, that you get some discretion, like you can move the temperature up or down by two degrees, three degrees, whatever it takes to address the hot cold complaint, but you're not going to be able to override that thermostat permanently, right? So you still have the flexibility 
and the agency to address a customer complaint for, for hot or cold, but you've got these guardrails in place to ensure that you're still going to be having an efficient setback when your facility is unoccupied, right? And so I think there's simple things like that, that even the smaller operators with just a handful of locations can take advantage of and reap, reap the same benefits. All right. So before we wrap up, Jay, what are some of the new maybe technologies, features that Powerhouse Dynamics is working on or exploring to to help with these new industry trends? Sure. Well, I mean, there's continued iteration improvements every day to what we're doing on the energy management side. So better software tools for finding other opportunities and cutting, whether it's demand charges from energy bills and continue to reduce uh, total energy consumption. So that's always a, a continuous iterative process from our engineering development team's uh, side. On uh, the food service side, I mean, it's just an acceleration of connectivity of critical equipment. Um, you know, we're developing, you know, th- there are part of the challenge of what we do is it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, we like to make it look simple, right? But behind all that simplicity is a lot of sophisticated technology in part because there are no universal standards for connecting equipment, right? And people have tried uh, over the years, and uh, it's just tough to herd the cats. So we've taken a, a, a different approach, which is to create a whole kit of tools. We call it our integration layer. So that con- kit continues to expand, and we're starting to see some adoption of these tools that we're making that just makes it super easy for an, any new manufacturer to get their equipment into the open kitchen platform. And that's really our goal is by providing an open platform, we are OEM agnostic, right? And providing the tools to make it as frictionless as possible to get the data from that piece of equipment into our platform. It's just going to accelerate the adoption uh, and everyone wins, right? The OEM wins because their customers are asking for it. The customers get a single platform to tie everything together. And it's easier on our engineering team, right, to pull this new piece of equipment and all of its data into our system. Thank you for joining us, Jay. And real quick, where can our listeners find out more about Powerhouse Dynamics and the the solutions you all offer? Great. Yeah, just go to powerhousedynamics.com. You'll see a lot of information available there for you on both the Open Kitchen platform as well as SiteSage. All right. Thank you so much. Fantastic, Matt. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for listening to the PartsCast. Be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you stream your podcasts.